to welcome you all to the Discipleship Hour broadcast. Appreciate the fact you've tuned us in today. And uh, we find ourselves in the eighth chapter. We were in the eighth chapter last week. We're going to be in it again this week. I don't want to go over this most wonderful material too quickly. Um, psychologists ran a survey recently to discover what people thought about most. And the two things they came up with, right at the top of the list, are sex and death, in that order. Sex and death, the things that people think most about. Now, have you ever wondered why that is so? Isn't that interesting? Well, we're going to find out the answer to that in today's message. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll begin today's study. Lord God, thank you for our Bible study today. We pray that you would open eyes. Give us wisdom concerning your words, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in our last broadcast, we discovered that the Pharisees come up with a wonderful, what they considered a trick. We're going to bring this woman caught in adultery to Jesus. And uh, we're going to say to him, uh, Lord, this, uh, this woman was caught in the very act. What do you think we ought to do with her? The law of Moses is to take her out and stone her death. What do you say? And of course, it was all a setup. They didn't bring the man. He was involved in it also, but uh, just the woman. And uh, if Jesus said, well, why don't you just let her go, then they'd accuse him of breaking the law of Moses. On the other hand, if he said, go ahead and uh, stone her to death, they'd have turned him into the Romans because capital punishment was solely up to them. So they thought they had Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. And there's this woman laying on the ground in the midst of his Bible study, and they asked Jesus the question, and he says, absolutely nothing. <laughs> now, we discovered last week that he, he, he knelt down, he bowed down. He started writing on the ground with his finger. And by the way, the only other time in Scripture that we find Jesus writing with his finger is found in the book of Exodus when Moses went up Mount Sinai and God gave him the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. <laughs> Lord Jesus is writing in the sand, in the dust of the temple, and the Pharisees kept bugging him. Why don't you say something? We've asked you a question. Are you going to do nothing? And all the while, they're looking at this writing on the sand, as we discovered last week. And I uh, suppose, and of course, I can't be dogmatic about that, but I think that quite likely he was writing the names of their lovers, people that they, in fact, had committed adultery with. And here they are about to stone a poor woman to death for committing a sin that they themselves are guilty of. And when they saw the names written in the dust, they began to peel away. <laughs> and finally, there's just the woman standing there. And Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? Does nobody here to accuse you? And we're picking up in verse, um, <clears throat> verse 10. Then Jesus raised himself up. He saw no one but the woman, and he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Does no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. A couple of things I want you to note about this story. Number one, the Lord Jesus didn't rebuke this woman. He didn't say, Lady, what is the matter with you? Don't you know one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not commit adultery? There wasn't even a hint of rebuke. She'd already been totally humbled by these Pharisees that have thrown her down in the middle of a huge crowd. The Lord Jesus, in great tenderness and love, he looked beyond her sin and he saw her great need. Who knows what this poor woman had been through? Who knows? The Pharisees didn't care. All they cared about, she was caught in adultery. Well, maybe her husband had left her and she was committing immorality to raise some money to feed her hungry children. We're not going to stand on judgment, or Jesus didn't. And you know what? This is a wonderful way to treat people. You come to them and see their need, not rebuking them, not standing in judgment over them, but looking beyond that and saying, this is person is a slave. They're a slave, and a slave needs to be free. And you know, let's say if you'd been living in the 1800s, and maybe you'd been visiting New Orleans, and maybe you'd seen these slaves, these black slaves, standing on platforms with chains around their ankles and their, their wrists, and they were, they were being auctioned off, two or three hundred bucks apiece. Would you stand on the front of the platform and point a finger at them and say, what is the matter with you people? Why don't you remove those chains? 
They're totally in incapable of removing those chains. They're slaves. The word redemption means to buy back from the marketplace of sin, slave marketry of sin, excuse me, to purchase back from the slavery, slave market of sin. That's what the word redemption means. The Lord Jesus is our Redeemer. He purchased out, out of the slave marketry of sin. How outrageous it would be for you to criticize anybody that was on that platform in change. They can't help themselves. They're slaves. This poor lady is a slave of her immorality. Jesus isn't about to rebuke her or chase, chase, chastise her. He merely reaches out to her in great love and said, where are your accusers? They're gone. Nobody condemn you. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. How wonderful. This is the way Jesus treats folks. And you know what? I see a lot of hateful Christians around today that are so quick to stand in judgment on other people that they think have fallen into some kind of sin of one sort or the other. And I see it most predominantly when it comes to homosexuals. Oh, how could they do that terrible thing? You think your adultery is any better? <laughs> you should be looking beyond their sin and seeing their terrible need. I heard the testimony this week of a man when he was five years of age was fondled as a little boy in a public bathroom. He struggled with his sexuality. He became a homosexual, and God delivered him out of it. Do you want to stand in judgment on that man? I've counseled many a homosexual in my life and presented the claims of the Lord Jesus to him. And when in in-depth conversations with him, I have never counseled one. Now, maybe there are others, but not to my understanding, that it was not in some way taken advantage of when they were a child. Does it happen any other way? Maybe so, but I haven't discovered it so in my own experience. Let's not stand on judgment on anybody. They're slaves. They need to be freed. Jesus died for their sins to deliver them from that slave market. Wonderful truth we have here. And by the way, these long-faced Pharisees have caught this woman and dragged her in there, slinking off. Their conscience is bothering them. They're thinking, uh-oh, he caught me. How did he know? And maybe the next day, one of them sitting in a, a coffee shop in Jerusalem, maybe one of his Pharisee friends approached him and said, well, you caught that, got that woman in adultery. Did you catch Jesus, by the way? Did you catch him in any kind of his words saying the wrong thing? And did you stone that woman? They would have said, well, actually, we, we didn't. We, uh, we left her there with him, and we didn't stone her. Well, why didn't you? Well, because... Uh, Jesus knew something about me that uh, I didn't think anybody knew. And what would that be? Well, do you remember last year when you and I on a business trip were at Corinth? And we were in that hotel outside of Jerusalem, and we invited those and paid for those two uh, ladies of the night to come on up? Yes, I remember that, but how would he know that? Well, that's a very good question, but he did. He not only knew the name of my girlfriend, he knew the name of your girlfriend, too. <laughs> this Jesus, he must think it's wrong to commit immorality in places other than uh, outside, of, uh, outside of Israel. I thought the law only applied to Israel. God says, thou not shalt commit adultery. Well, surely he's talking about just Israel. You see people always looking for little loopholes in the Bible, reasons that they can justify their sin. Now, if you think that I'm exaggerating on the point I just made about them committing adultery down in Corinth, when Jesus went down to the Gadarenes and uh, freed that demon-possessed man, and the demons went rushing into a herd of swine, where do you think those swine came from? Swine weren't allowed to be raised in the land of Israel. The law said, don't raise any swine on the land of Israel. They raised them the Gadarenes, on wooden platforms, a loophole in the law. <laughs> so they fought. So a little bit like um, W.C. Fields was a, uh, quite a comedian in the 30s and 40s in America. And uh, when he was on his deathbed, they found the old boy sitting there with a the Bible in front of him. And, and they said, well, W.C. Fields, you're reading the Bible? He says, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> well... There are no loopholes in the scriptures. They're very clear. And if we want to deviate from the truth of the scripture, we'll do it at our own peril. 
This lady says, Lord, nobody condemns me. Jesus said, neither do I. And the next verse he says, and this is what we're picking up for today's message, I am the light of the world. If any man follows after me, he'll have the light of life, and he'll not walk in darkness. Now, the Pharisees, boy, they were not happy about this declaration that he's making. And by the way, can you imagine any man standing on a platform or a pulpit or anywhere in the world saying, I am the light of the world? If any man follows me, he'll not walk in darkness? Wow, what a statement. Good thing he opened the eyes of the blind in the next chapter to verify his wonderful claim. He is the light of the world, and if any man follows him, he will not walk in darkness. This lady that Jesus forgave walked away. The chains fell off of her ankles, her wrist. She was free from immorality. Why? Because she'd found the light of the world, and she'd found the love of her life. Jesus. And this Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, went to the cross a short while later to die and pay for this lady's sin. He redeemed her. He bought her out of the slave marketry of sin and freed her. And she walked away as a joyful, happy lady. It was the worst day in her life because the Pharisees made it thus. And Jesus made it the best day of her life because he forgave her and she walked away in freedom. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. I'm the light of the world. And by the way, 100 yards from where he spoke this statement was a menorah. Now, the menorah was a golden candlestick that the Jewish people used to light the inner sanctuary, basically. Menorah was made of solid gold. King Solomon made it. And it was a most beautiful, spectacular lampstand. You've never seen anything like it. It was quite large, quite heavy, and it had this oil, this pure olive oil, lit it up. And Jesus, referring to himself, I am the light of the world. Without me, there is no light in the world. The same way as if you blew out the menorah in the next room, it would become completely dark. What a dark, lonely, gloomy, unhappy world it would be without Jesus. He is the light of the world. And I love this analogy because without light, there's nothing but death. If you don't think so, um, try covering up your plants. Put them in a dark room for a day or two. They die. Even plant life needs light, not to mention human beings. They have something in my neck of the woods called cabin fever. I'm, I'm from Canada. And uh, in the wintertime, when the sun basically stops shining and it rains all the time, I'm from Vancouver, it used to rain all the time, people would uh, go inside, and you know what? They get quite depressed in there, not being out in the sun. In the Netherlands, in Europe, they have the highest alcoholic rate of any nation and the highest suicide rate, and scientists determine it's because of a lack of sunshine. They are lacking sunshine vitamin D3. And it brings about all kinds of health issues, most notably depression. Wow. Man needs light. Now, if the physical body needs light, how about the spiritual man on the inside? He needs light too. The Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If any man follows me, he'll not walk in darkness. What a claim. Now, on that note, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 John, the first chapter, because John picks up on this same theme in this little epistle of, uh, of 1 John. And I am looking, going to pick up right at verse, verse 4. Listen to John speaking. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. That is a theme of 1 John. God wants us to have fullness of joy. He who follows me shall have the light of life and not walk in darkness. That lady caught in adultery. She was one miserable, unhappy lady. That's what the law does. She had given up on trying to keep the law. Long time ago, I'm sure she kept giving up on it. I can't keep this law. There's no point in doing it. So she just threw the whole thing overboard and let it all hang out, so to speak. She did her own thing. And she was one miserable person. On the other hand, the Pharisees that brought the woman caught in adultery, they thought, no doubt, that they were keeping the law quite well, thank you. And uh, there was no need to be um, corrected by anybody, particularly this Nazarene fellow, this prophet from Nazareth, 
We don't need him to tell us what to do. He didn't even graduate from one of our schools. And so they thought they were keeping the law, and they also had another thing in common with the woman caught in adultery. They also were adulterers. They just didn't do it openly like she did. You see, people who think they can keep the law will either wind up in the state of the woman, throw it off, cast it off entirely, or wind up as long-faced, self-righteous, judgmental Pharisees. <laughs> either way, it's a bad deal. <laughs> God wants us to have a fullness of joy, and brother, the law doesn't bring joy. All it brings is judgment. Listen to John speaking. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full, and this is the message we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Let me stop right there. John says, you know what? We've heard a lot of things from Jesus. He's taught a lot of things, a lot of theology. But there's one thing that he was trying to get across that no doubt is most important of all the things he said. If you miss out on this aspect of his teaching, you're going to miss the whole shebang. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. God is light, and there's no darkness in him at all. God is completely holy. He's completely righteous. He is incapable of doing anything wrong. There's no darkness in him whatsoever. The Pharisees accused Jesus of everything in the book, healing people on the Sabbath. What a terrible person. I remember listening to the History Channel quite recently, and they had some pastors on there. And uh, they were asking him, the commentators, about... Uh, the stories in the Old Testament where God judged certain cities and uh, like Jericho and uh, other cities besides that. And uh, why did God uh, put the women and children to death along with the, the soldiers? Why did God tell them to kill everybody in the entire city? And their answer, these uh, religious folks, these pastors, liberal pastors, not ones that believed God's word, said this. God is a bully, and he was having a temper tantrum. Exact words. I'm quoting it word for word. God is a bully, and he was having a temper tantrum. I remember reading Rob Bell's book, The Velvet Jesus. He got to the point about Jericho, where God commanded Joshua, the Israeli army, leave nothing breathing in this city except one woman, the harlot Rahab and her family. And he said, what intelligent person, I'm quoting verbatim, Rob Bell said, what intelligent person could possibly believe that a righteous and loving God would command Joshua to kill everybody in the city? I can believe it because it's 100% true. There is no darkness, not a hint of darkness. God is more innocent than a newborn baby. We need to get our head screwed on straight. And the people that don't understand that have got that issue. Let me give you God's estimation of why he allowed it to happen. Number one, the city of Jericho, and in fact the land of Canaan, was given over 400 years to repent and get their act together. God said the iniquity of the Amorites is not quite full. I can't bring my people out of the land of Egypt until these people have been giving a chance, another chance, another chance. They're worshiping idols. He had his missionaries in there. They weren't listening to God's prophets. They were worshiping idols and sacrificing their children to these idols. Moloch, the idol Moloch. They would put a fire in a, a idol, a, a metal idol. They'd put the child right in the arms of a red-hot idol, and they'd have a huge band behind them making this ungodly noise to drown out the crying and screaming of the child. These were a wicked people. When archaeologists went into these cities, they discovered little babies born in the foundation of these buildings. Good luck charm. Talk about murdering the children. What children would be the question I'd ask. They'd murdered most of them. Now I'll give you God's answer. If these little children had been let to live and survived and reached the age of accountability, with a bitterness in their heart because of what Joshua and the Israelis did to their families. They would have died 
who knows when, 100, 150 years, wouldn't make any difference. They would have wound up in a Christless hell. And God in his love and his mercy allowed these little ones to die and they went right into his presence. And let me tell you, he loved every last one of them. And he loved all the people of Jericho, every last one of them. He gave them every opportunity. I'm talking about the people who would reached the age of accountability. The children, he took them home yonder into his presence. And the problem with these uh, armchair theologians that think that God is a bully, they don't believe in heaven, most of them, and they absolutely don't, I can assure you, believe in hell. But both of them are real. And these little ones went right into God's presence, and there is fullness of joy in his presence. What a wonderful place to be. The safest thing that God could do. And this idea that, oh, the God of the Old Testament's a bully, but we like Jesus. No, the God of the Old Testament is Jesus, and all things he does are right. He's incapable of doing anything other than that. They don't like my answer? I can't do a thing about that. Listen to him. This is a message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. And John is actually speaking to the Gnostics of the first and second century. And they had also found the loophole in the Bible. Because they were immoral people, they decided they would, because they wanted to be religious, would be to shape the scriptures around their theology. And so what they had done is, head guy, the, the Gnostics with a guy by the name of Srinthus, he said, God is spirit. He wasn't really a body. Jesus didn't have a physical body. He was a spirit being, kind of like a phantom. They thought he had a body, but he actually didn't. He was a spirit being. And a matter of fact, all matter is basically evil. So God couldn't have had a body. And by the way, since all matter is evil and the body is evil, it's okay if I commit immorality because God doesn't care it's evil anyway. That was his justification. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, talk about looking for loopholes. And so John says, no, that's not the way it is. God did take on flesh, after all, a phantom doesn't shed blood when he's dying on a cross. And God does care about the body. And any man that says, oh, I know God, but he hates his brother, that man's a liar. And the truth isn't in him. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If any man follows me, he'll not walk in darkness. Most wonderful truth we find here. <laughs> you can be free from the worst bondages that you can even imagine. May I suggest a couple of them to you? How about hatred? There's a lot of people that got hatred in their heart. I was just reading the story, testimony of Dr. Ben Carson. He's probably the most um, famous surgeon in America. Matter of fact, when he was 33 years of age, he was the head of uh, the neurological surgical department of John Hopkins University. When he was a young teenager, he was so filled with anger, brought up in Los Angeles, inner city. Father was nowhere to be seen. And uh, as a very angry young black man, there was a boy that aggravated him at school, and he took a long knife and jabbed it into his belly. Ben Carson was about 13, 14 years of age. The blade of the belt, of the, of the knife rather, broke because it hit the belt buckle. God is wonderful, saved him from an awful catastrophe. Another time he was raising a hammer to hit his mother on the head with it, filled with rage. His brother stepped behind him and grabbed his hand so he couldn't do it. And Ben said to himself, he's 16, 17 years of age, I have got an anger issue. If I don't get it under control, I'm going to go nowhere in this life. He took a Bible, he went into a bathroom, and he stayed there for three hours and prayed. And when he walked out, he'd found God, he'd found the light of the world, he'd been walking in the light ever since, and what a wonderful man he is. <laughs> he has performed brain surgery on people that nobody else would even attempt. He separated two Siamese twins that were joined at the head. He's a genius, <laughs> wonderful man. God freed him from that horrible 
bondage of anger. What a blessing. What a blessing indeed. And so, if we say we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we lie. I did a funeral quite recently to a good friend of mine, and this kind of fits in with what we're sharing today. And uh, this was quite an elderly gentleman. He had a son who belonged to a church down in Miami. It was a gay church. He played the, uh, played the organ at that church. And uh, at the funeral, godly man, his son showed up with probably, I'm going to guesstimate, probably half the church showed up. Uh, homosexuals, including the pastor. Not ex-homosexuals, practicing homosexuals. And yet they were all, quote, Christian. But God says if we walk in darkness, we lie. Homosexuality is sin. And when I got up to speak at my friend's funeral, I shared with them a little bit about my own life. I never accused them of anything. I, again, here's the principle. Don't start criticizing a man who's got chains on his ankles and chains on his wrists. We don't criticize slaves. I shared with them the love of God, that God loved every last one of them. And this man, what a wonderful man of God he was. He came from a religious family. <laughs> and when he got saved out in Los Angeles, 1944, 45, he called home. His dad was a pastor. His dad was a missionary in India. And he said, Dad, I found Jesus. I've been born again. His mother got on the phone and said, Son, but son, you've always been such a good boy. Implication, you don't need Jesus. You're a good boy. His father, brothers and sisters, belonged to a church that didn't believe the word of God. Salvation to them was keeping the Sermon on the Mount walking in darkness, denying God's word. What a wonderful thing to be redeemed, and what a wonderful testimony this man was to his son and to all these members of this church who heard the word of God that a redeemer has come. A redeemer has come. But you know what? Why do we have to deny it and hide like the Pharisees? You know what they could have done? When they saw the name written in the sand, they could have said, uh-oh, my number's up. He knows. He says that he is God in the flesh, and you know what? Only God could know about what I did down in Corinth <laughs> a year ago. I feel horrible about this. And you know what? I'm wrong. Here I am about ready to stone a woman to death for something I've been doing myself. Jesus, do you think that you could forgive me, Lord? And Jesus would have said to them, go and sin no more. That's what he would have said. Wouldn't have been a word of rebuke. He would have said, go and sin no more. The light of the world has come. He's given us light. He's given us love. And he's given us freedom from sin. All men are of sin. Pornography, drug addiction, alcoholism. You name the manner of sin. Only Jesus can free you from it. He's the redeemer. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. What a promise that your joy may be full. Listen to him again as he speaks in verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. I love this. The darkness is passing away. He's not talking about the end of the age. It's going to get darker as we reach the end of the age. The world's going to get worse. The darkness he's talking about is the darkness of sin in our life. When we trust Christ, we put our faith in him, his spirit comes to live inside of our body. And when he comes to live inside, the light comes to live inside, he reveals the darkness. I didn't know what true sin was until I got saved. <laughs> I had an inkling of what it was, and surely my conscience bothered me when I did certain things, but after a while you can deaden your conscience too. But when Jesus comes to live inside, the light comes to shine to show you what sin is. He gives you discernment. There is right and there is wrong. There is right and there is wrong, and God shows you the difference between the two. <laughs> Jesus comes to live inside, and he begins to deliver you. Deliver you 
from the darkness. What a wonderful blessing. The darkness is passing away. <laughs> the light is shining. Well, let's go on back to the Gospel of John and see what else we can discover. And we finished in verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. They didn't like him talking about him self being the light of the world. And he goes on to tell them, look, it's my father. He's the one that told me to say these things. My doctrine comes from his. They don't like that. Then they say to him in verse 19, where is your father? And by the way, you need to understand the implications of that. Where is your father? In the Talmud, the Jewish commentary, the father of Jesus was a Roman soldier they'd written down, who had an illicit relationship with a young maid by the name of Mary. In other words, Jesus was illegitimate. And when they said, where is your father? They weren't thinking about the heavenly father. They're thinking about an earthly father. This is a Nazarene, the prophet from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Listen to Jesus' response to him. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Did you hear that, Jehovah's Witnesses? If you'd known Jesus, you'd known the Father also because he's one with the Father. And to know the Father is to know him. To know him is to know the Father. These words Jesus spoke in the treasure as he taught in the temple, and no one laid their hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin, where I go, you cannot come. This is a very profound, sad statement. Jesus knew that what he said to them was of extreme importance that they'd understand and believe it. Because he knew just a few short years later, approximately 30 years later, 70 AD would come, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and these very men he's talking to would die. If they died before that without trusting him, they would go to hell. Listen to his words again. I am going away, meaning he's going to go to a cross, he's going to ascend into heaven, and you will seek me for 2,000 years. The nation has been seeking their Messiah, but they haven't found him. And you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. He doesn't give any loopholes here whatsoever. His words are explicitly clear. And anybody that would teach universalism or a second chance after death is teaching something that's contrary to God's word and making Jesus to be a liar. Where I come, you cannot come. And if you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sin. God has made it so simple for humanity. He loves everybody. He invites everybody, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He loved these men he's contending with. This is a clash between light and darkness. He's fighting for the souls of men. In great love and compassion, he's speaking to them. You've got to believe that I'm the Messiah, that I am the light of the world. I have fed 15,000 people three days before. I've raised up an impotent man who was that way for 38 years. I am going to heal a man who is blind, but that way from birth. All these miracles. You just need to believe this, the truth. That's all that God is asking, just to believe the truth. He's not asking much when you think about it, is he? Listen to him. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which are heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father, then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. He is prophesying His means of death. 
Normally when a man committed a blasphemy, which they consider to be when you claim to be the Son of God, they take you out and stone you to death. That's what they did after all to Stephen, first martyr of the church. But Jesus is prophesying, no, it was predicted in the Old Testament that the Messiah would die on a tree. Because the Bible says, cursed is everyone that dies on a tree. And Jesus became a curse for us. It says in Psalm 22, they pierce my hands and my feet. They look, they stare upon me. Jesus said, when you lift me up, then you're going to know that I'm the Messiah. Did you realize how many wonderful things happened when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross? Passover day, he's the Passover lamb. They tried to prevent it. They didn't want anything spoiling the Passover. But Jesus was the lamb crucified before the foundation of the world. He had to die Passover day because he is the Passover lamb. And when he was lifted up, he fulfilled all kinds of prophecies. The Roman soldiers were doing what? They were gambling for Jesus' clothing, casting lot. But hold it now. Didn't it say that the soldiers would cast lots for the Messiah's garments? Psalm 22. 700 years before he was born, could Jesus change that? They would accuse him of manipulating and of making all these prophecies come to pass. A man hanging on a cross can't do anything. The Lord Jesus, after being hung on that cross for three hours, after man had done his very, very worst to him, God was going to do his worst to him. The Bible says that the judgment of God the Father came on God the Son. He bore the sins of the world, and blackness came over the planet for a three-hour period. No full moon, no total eclipse. God made it black. He blacked the whole thing out. The man couldn't see what was going on there, a great transaction like the world has never seen or ever will see. He was paying for the sins of the world. That lady caught in adultery. Jesus said, I condemn you not. Her sins were being paid for on that cross. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God blacked the planet out for three hours. And then a terrible earthquake happened in Jerusalem. Another miracle. And then the temple, inside the temple, the huge veil, half a foot thick, was ripped from top to bottom. How did that happen? Another wonderful miracle, the Bible says that the Levites, the, the priests in the temple, when this happened, they sewed the thing up. But many even became believers when the, when the apostles went out preaching the gospel because they remember how that veil ripped from top to bottom because God was signifying his son was dying on Calvary. Now there was access to God, direct access, direct access to God. Don't need a veil anymore. You can go into his presence. Anybody can through faith in Jesus. What a wonderful truth. When I'm lifted up, you're going to know that I am He. And by the way, we don't know how many people were saved that day, but we know of two. Thief on the cross. When he saw the way that Jesus died, he was cursing him out like the other guy was. Why don't you get us down if you're the Messiah, the Son of God? And he heard Jesus pray and say, Lord, talking to the people who crucified Hold not this sin against them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when the repentant thief saw the way Jesus spoke, he said to the other thief, you know, we're dying, we deserve it, but this man's done nothing amiss. Lord, there's that word again, same word. that The lady caught in adultery said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said this very day, you're going to be with me in paradise. He didn't get baptized, didn't join a church. He turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Only man that Jesus ever said, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. That guy got saved when he saw the way that Jesus died. And by the way, there was a Roman soldier. And when blackness came over the earth, he said, surely this was the Son of God. And he went away beating their breasts. Multitudes came to Jesus, I'm sure, on crucifixion day. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you're going to know. By the way, my listener friend, do you know? If you don't, let me encourage you to come to the Lord Jesus 
even today and put your faith in him, the gift of God's eternal life. We're not talking about religion here. Remember, the Pharisees had religion. Didn't do them much good, did it? The woman caught in adultery, she had religion before she cast it off. Didn't do her much good, did it? We're talking about a relationship with God that begins the moment you trust Christ as personal Savior. And it goes on forever. He that believes has eternal life. It doesn't get any better than that. Thank you for joining us in our broadcast today. May the Lord bless you. Until next time.